In case you were wondering, Shetland is just as windy and just as cold as you might think from that audio. It is a place where the wind just never stops. So a lot of you might be wondering, why are so many companies choosing to do business in areas like this, regions of the world that are so inhospitable that only amateur photographers with shaky cameras dare to go up to cover the launches that happen there? This, by the way, is Andoya, Norway, and it's not the only one of these inhospitable polar facilities where launch providers and satellite providers are choosing to do business rather than equatorial launch facilities, or at least closer to the equator launch facilities like Cape Canaveral or Guyana. Why is this the case? What makes these out-of-the-way spots so attractive? And now that these launch providers are here, how are they going to get their first rockets off the ground successfully and safely? All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon and welcome to another Angry Bulletin. I would like to take a few moments to recognize some more incredible people who helped me get here and also get to my family in South Carolina and back to the UK. Without your help, none of this would have been possible. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Nicholas Miller, Simon Vezina, Jonathan Simon Richmond, William Macbeth, Alan Staley, Donnie Counts, Sonia and Alexander, Renato Abotian, I'm probably mispronouncing some of these, I'm sorry, David Dunn, Fred Berbner, Tom Jaster, Campbell McNeil, Wayne Fox, Simon Corbett, Gregory Strasser, Benjamin Zimmer, Peter Bigala, Larry Bendix, Alan O'Donnell, Jeffrey Bird, Godfrey Supka, Edgar R. Mason, Stuart Evans, and ORG Incorporated. And there are still more. Thank you so very much. And if any of you would like to participate in contributing to this channel for my future activities, because I will be coming back here and going to other launch facilities as well, all the details are in the description. Let's get back to the topic at hand. So once again, as you can see, this is a very remote area. As a matter of fact, there's only about 800 people on the entire island of Unst. There are far more sheep on this chain of islands than there are people. That being the case then, how does moving a launch facility or establishing a launch facility and choosing to make use of it make any sense whatsoever? We've always been told that equatorial locations make more sense because at the equator, the Earth is moving faster and therefore you get sort of a slingshot assist from the Earth to gain a higher orbital velocity essentially for free. Well, RFA explains this on a recent press release, and I think they do a pretty good job of it. Quote, while launching from the equator provides additional speed from the Earth's rotation, this advantage is primarily relevant for higher or further orbits, in other words, geosynchronous, lunar, or interplanetary. For our purposes, proximity to the equator is not a crucial factor since we'll be launching in a direct north-south direction, so you don't get any slingshot assist when you're trying to launch in that trajectory. We're primarily targeting polar and sun synchronous orbits as that is the optimal location for the more commercially interesting constellations and Earth observation satellites. But is that really the case? Are there that many satellites that need to make use of a place like this? Well, actually, there is an increasing number of satellite manufacturers who intend to make use of polar orbits and especially sun synchronous orbits for their satellites because it provides a better coverage of the entire Earth's surface rather than just certain sections of it. As you can see from this animation, you can gradually 
cover every square centimeter on the surface of the Earth very efficiently if you are orbiting in a north-south direction. In addition to that, if you are orbiting high enough, in other words, about five to 600 kilometers or so, the sun never goes down in that trajectory. You will always have sunlight striking your solar panels if you take advantage of this type of orbital trajectory. By way of comparison, SpaceX rideshare missions don't go to this type of trajectory, or even if they could, Falcon 9s have to carry enormous numbers of small satellites, and each one of those satellites is going to have to have a specific orbital trajectory in order to make maximum use of its flight plan. If you have dozens or even hundreds of satellites on a single launch, it's going to be impossible to accommodate every single customer. You get a better idea of how useful this orbital trajectory is from this particular animation, which shows things from the satellite's point of view and how extensive and comprehensive of coverage it can gain from this type of orbit. And it is this combination of advantages that has led Rocket Lab to be so successful in launching its rockets from, well, the edge of the Earth, really, close to the South Pole and nowhere close to most satellite manufacturers. And yet, launching from that location has been very advantageous for a wide variety of customers, enough to support 50 launches thus far, and there certainly is enough customers to go around for other opportunities throughout the world, especially in Europe. Now, there are other factors as well. RFA chose SACS aboard because of a careful consideration of various factors like the fact that they're both private companies that share the same approach of cost efficiency, a fast pace, a go-get-it mentality because Andoya has been around for a very long time in Norway, but they've essentially stuck to sounding rockets and have not advanced too quickly until recently, whereas SACS aboard has developed their business plan since 2000. 2017, where it was just an idea, and now it's a licensed and operating spaceport. Also, Shetland has a rich oil and fishing industry with existing infrastructures such as industrial harbors, tool stores, suppliers, and even though Andoya is a bit further north than Shetland, it is certainly perfectly located to take advantage of polar and sun synchronous orbit opportunities. Both spaceports are well suited to that as is another spaceport in Sweden called the S-Range Space Center, which, by the way, has been launching rockets for over half a century, and they have established their first partnership with an orbital private space company out of South Korea and are scheduled to launch in 2025. So, obviously, these types of spaceports are extremely attractive, especially to emerging launch providers who are looking to provide services to niche types of customers, customers that need specific orbits for their purposes and have very specific assignments for their satellite constellations. But also, in the future, we could be talking about things like space stations. There have been a number of space station designs that would work out a lot lot better if they make use of sun synchronous orbits so that their solar panels are constantly generating energy as opposed to only half the time when they're in the shadow of the earth like the International Space Station. So now that we know why these locations are so advantageous, let's have a look at what's about to happen and how it's about to happen here in Saxavord. First of all, the most important thing for us to consider because I've talked about the rocket RFA-1 many times. We also should talk about stage zero. And those of you who are tank watchers for Boca Chica, you should know what this means. It is the launch site for the rocket itself. And the better you design this, the better the chance that you're gonna have a successful first launch or first test launch. 
And this is something, as much as I hate to say it, that SpaceX failed miserably at during their first launch attempt from Boca Chica. It is unfortunate that SpaceX underestimated the performance and power of this rocket so drastically to where they utterly destroyed their own launch pad and very possibly could have destroyed the rocket as well had they not gotten so incredibly lucky. Let me explain why this is the case. Let's have a look at the key components of a launch site because RFA hasn't exactly established a mobile launch facility like some small sat launch providers. They have a permanent launch facility at SACS aboard. So let's have a look at the launch stool first. This is, in this case, a large gray steel structure on four legs, to put it simply, but it does not just hold the RFA-1 in place before the launch. It also allows RFA staff to work on things like the engines when the vehicle is fully integrated and vertical. The structure is made of stainless steel, that sounds familiar, and has to withstand the strong winds and salty, corrosive sea air. Also, the company that built the launch stool comes from the maritime structural engineering sector. And incidentally, you may remember, SpaceX has done this as well. They've employed lots of people in the maritime sector to work with stainless steel because they have lots of experience in welding it. Now, like SpaceX, RFA has a fuel farm, what SpaceX calls a tank farm, where they store everything that is necessary to fuel the launch vehicle, inert gases, propellants, oxidizers, and other liquids until it's time to fill RFA-1 with them in a precisely time and temperature controlled manner. For example, liquid oxygen gases off at an ambient temperature so they have to continuously cool it and fill it into the rocket at precisely the right temperature so it, it is perfectly fueled for launch. The fuel farm is protected by an earth wall and connected to the launch stool by several different size pipelines. Again, this is very similar to how SpaceX does things. As a matter of fact, SpaceX also recently built an earth wall. It actually was a while ago that they built this to try to protect the tank farm from Starship. And even though RFA-1 is absolutely tiny compared to Starship, they take similar precautions, but they have taken additional precautions, which SpaceX has not done. Now, before we get to that, they do have many sensors and valves on that ground support equipment, ensuring that everything is perfectly coordinated. Keeping track of everything is crucial and an art in itself, as they say on their press release. So let's go back to the launch stool. To the right, you can see a yellow tower, which is called the umbilical tower. All the fuel pipelines, power, and data cables run up the rocket to their respective stages via this tower using interfaces. These only get disconnected when the rocket lifts off. And in case you're worried about the wind, further up the umbilical tower, there are collar clamps to stabilize the rocket in windy conditions. There are also eight massive hold down clamps at the lower end, which is absolutely crucial to make sure that we don't have a repeat of that embarrassing accident that took place with the Chinese company Pioneer Space a few days ago. Let's hope nobody was actually injured in that accident, according to the Chinese media. Nobody was hurt at all. I tend to not believe that given the size of the explosion, but I can deal with that in another video. These clamps obviously only let go when the thrust is right and all systems are running as planned. The clamps obviously stay in place during a static fire. By the way, the umbilical tower was built by repurposing a decommissioned and commercially available construction site crane. So classic, cost-effective, pragmatic RFA. They are very good at making making use of off-the-shelf components and repurposing components for spaceflight rather than building all of this stuff from scratch. That is their philosophy. It is sort of the anti-rocket lab philosophy, and we'll see if it works out. 
let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the hanger. Like the launch tool, the hanger is another seemingly simple structure, just a steel building with a concrete floor, but behind the doors, it's the place where all the magic happens. They're going to conduct their final tests in this hangar before integrating all three stages of RFA-1 into the final launch vehicle. The hangar serves as their technical workshop, complete with a clean room for integrating satellites with the Redshift OTV. The Redshift OTV is a sort of a kick stage for the rocket. If you're interested in all of that, I have some videos linked at the end of this one that details more about Redshift and RFA's other products for their RFA-1 rocket. Now, it's important to note that although RFA is leasing this facility, this integration facility is available to all of Saxaford's customers, and it was Saxaford that built the place. So they have a world-class integration facility, which, by the way, I'll be touring sometime in future days, where we'll get an opportunity to see just how extensive of services Saxaford has for their upcoming customers besides RFA. So let's get back to a feature that RFA has here that SpaceX did not have, at least not for the first launch, and that's a flame deflector ramp. RFA constructed their own ramp that sits below the rocket. It, of course, serves to deflect the powerful exhaust of RFA-1 so it exits horizontally. Obviously, this makes the exhaust go away from the fuel farm. That's pretty important. But in addition, without it, the exhaust jet would go straight into the ground, causing dust and stones to be thrown upwards against the rocket and into the engines, which again is precisely what happened to Starship when it didn't have a flame deflector. While the ramp is made out of stainless steel as well, they've also of course supplied a fire-resistant concrete, probably similar to the ones that NASA uses in order to make it reusable. On top of this, RFA has a water deluge system, water that's injected into the sides of the exhaust. This reduces the heat from flames and dampens noise and shock waves, maintaining the structural integrity of the suit stool and protecting the vehicle. It is also what creates a large white cloud that you usually see during rocket launches. It's just water vapor. But the reason that it works is the droplets from a water deluge system disrupts sound waves as they pass through the water. And if you didn't have this, the sound waves would reflect off of the concrete pad beneath and travel straight up into your rocket. Actually, some of the early space shuttle launches didn't have this feature and the sound waves would rattle off some of the heat tiles prior to launch. Fortunately, not enough got rattled off to endanger the first launch of Columbia, but it was something they took care of very quickly after that first launch launch. In addition, there is an umbilical tower that has a high point, the highest point actually on the entire Saxavort Peninsula, that serves as a lightning rod. And finally, there's a communication system, and that is critical as well, of course. You have to be able to communicate both with the launch crew and with the rocket itself. Is the pressure right? How much fuel do you have in the tank? Are the engines cold enough? Are the valves working? Does the flight computer have everything under control? Control. To monitor all of this, RFA currently has many sensors on RFA-1 and the launch pad that automatically check the health of all the ground systems and the rocket and send the data to their team who communicate with each other via a radio system. Now, it's important to note that the vast majority of this complex can actually be torn down and relocated. The launch stool is a little bit more complicated, but the rest of it can be moved to other other launch facilities around the world, from Augsburg to Shetland and beyond. Also, it's important to note that RFA will be launching from Guyana as well for different types of orbital configurations, but still, it is important to note that RFA is going to be conducting their first ever launch from this amazing facility up by the Arctic Circle, and there will be a lot more launches to come. Thank you very much for watching. Please don't forget to like and subscribe, and as always, stay angry about space.